Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Talmud from Love of Christ Lutheran Church in Mesa, Arizona. Each week, Pastor Nanette Christofferson and I try to provide an introduction to two of our assigned Bible readings for Sunday. We're going to take a look uh, for Sunday, April 14th, 2024, to one of Luke's resurrection appearance accounts, 2436b to 48. Just leading into uh, this uh, account, I, I think it's important for us to try to think about all the emotions that are linked to uh, this this uh, never before experience of somebody dying and resurrecting. And yeah, we could say Lazarus did that and there were other miracle stories. But in this case, we know that Jesus is not to die again as unlike those other ones. So when have you experienced the combination of joy, disbelief and wonderment? Maybe it's the birth of a child. Maybe it has been the witnessing of some sort of miracle or God moment. Uh, and then when have you wanted something so desperately to be true, but you dared not to believe it could be or would be? And, uh, and sometimes I think when I ask that question, we think that if we want it so bad, it's never going to happen because we want it so bad. Uh, but I, I want you to ponder those kinds of uh, questions because I think those are linked into some of the emotion tied to the witnesses of the resurrection. Uh, leading into our story, it's the walk to Emmaus. Uh, and uh, Peter got up, he, he ran to the tomb, he stooped in looking into the, and saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home. So we don't know what home means. Did he go to Capernaum? Did he go back to Jerusalem? I think he went back to Jerusalem where the disciples had gathered. Amazed at what had happened. Amazed, shocked, uh, wonderment, bewilderment, all those kinds of emotions are there. Now on that same day, two of them, two of the disciples, and again the disciples were more than the 12. Some scholars uh, suggest there might have been 120 you know, highly committed followers of Jesus going into Jerusalem. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. So I give you a map. You can see uh, it's, it's about a seven-mile walk uh, to Emmaus uh, from uh, Jerusalem. And they were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And how often have we done that after we've been to some amazing, uh, you know, celebratory event or some horrible, difficult, painful event? Have we just been with others we care about and just processed, debriefed, worked through? While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. We don't know how to interpret that. Was this a God thing or was this just a human response to grief and shock of what they just witnessed with Jesus being buried and now hearing rumors that he had risen from the dead? Uh, we don't know, but somehow their Jesus is the resurrected Jesus and they can't recognize him. Their eyes were kept from recognizing 30 to 31. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open. So they're walking along. Jesus explains the scriptures to them. We don't have all the verses, but you can read all of 24. And, uh, and as they're walking along, their, their hearts are warm by what he's saying of how, you know, everything that happened to Jesus was foretold in uh, the Jewish Bible. It, but it was then when they sat at table, they had insisted that he stay with them. They practiced hospitality. They knew it was night. Jesus, or, or friend, they didn't know he was Jesus, come stay with us. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Was this a Star Trek thing where Jesus got beamed up? How, how does this all work? We can't explain it. We weren't there. And uh, I think we're wasting our energy trying to explain how Jesus vanished. But what we do know is that their eyes go from being unable to recognize him to recognizing him through the breaking of the bread and the giving of that bread and sharing it with them. So then, what is their response? They get up and return to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he's appeared to Simon. So Simon Peter had some sort of experience with Jesus that we don't see in this reading. But somehow that's happened, and now they're saying he's appeared to them. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he'd been known to them in the breaking of the bread. 
So that leads us, and this is the strongest connection we have to this story, is how do you and I experience the presence of Christ through the gift of Holy Communion? In catechism, many of us learn, studying the small catechism that Luther taught, that we understand Christ to be present. And, and the body and, 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 and the blood of Christ are present in the bread and wine, in, with, and under. We don't, we don't, uh, we don't teach that the bread and the wine are no longer bread and wine, like the Catholics say that, that the, the bread and wine change into the actual body and blood of Christ with the words of institution. And we're not like the Baptists or uh, others who say that every time we eat and drink, we're just remembering what Jesus did on that Last Supper. Theologically, we confess that Christ is in, with, and under the bread and the wine, and the body and blood of Christ are present in that meal in the mystery of God's working to bring to us the means of God's love, God's presence, God's forgiveness, God's unconditional love. So... How do you experience that? When you come forward and take the wafer and take a little wine or grape juice or maybe you break a loaf of bread or however you receive the Holy, Holy Communion, how do you experience the presence of Christ? 36 to 39. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified. Again, frame this from the last word that people knew was Jesus was dead, crucified, dead, and buried. And now there's these rumblings, these reports, there's these, uh, these testimonies that Jesus is somehow now resurrected, he is alive, and their brains are having a hard time absorbing that, accepting it, receiving that. And so they're startled and terrified when they see Jesus, and what do they automatically think? They think they're seeing a ghost. Their minds are doing tricks on them. And he said to them, why are you frightened? And why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. This is a witness or a testimony to the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They could touch him. They could see him. They could witness that, that yes, his body was wounded. Yes, his body had the holes where he hung on the cross. But they could see that he wasn't a spirit. They could see that he wasn't a ghost. He was physically present in this, in this gathering of disciples. Verses 40 to 42, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, while in their joy they were disbelieving. Again, it goes back to that earlier question. How can something you want to be true, your mind tells you it just can't be true because it's never happened before. So they're still wondering. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering. Last week we had Doubting Thomas. This week we have a large gathering of disciples. They're still trying to wrap their brain around Jesus died and Jesus is risen and now Jesus is present. Then he goes to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and, they took, and he took it and he ate in their present. So this is no ghost, no spirit, no hologram. This is the physical resurrected Christ in their midst. 43 to 47. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. This is kind of a summary of what he told the two guys on the road to Emmaus. Again, everything that happened in Holy Week was previously told in the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures. Then 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. How open-minded are we to believe and trust? How often we had the experience of reading the scriptures and maybe we knew, we thought we knew the story and then we read it again and we realize, oh, there's something here that I didn't understand that's coming uh, to my attention here that speaks really to my situation and circumstances. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. 
and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. This is set in the table for Luke's book of Acts as the disciples will become apostles sent to the ends of the world. It lines up uh, with Matthew's ending of his gospel of, uh, uh, of go and make disciples of all nations. This, this proclamation is not to be held as a secret. It's not to be kept locked tight in their hearts and minds. It is to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth to all nations. Luke has, has Jesus teach the disciples that what they have witnessed is in fulfillment to what has previously been said in the Jewish Bible and by Jesus himself. Now it is their turn to tell others. So Acts is the handoff and the expanding witness of the Jesus movement. So in this season of Easter, I always encourage uh, members of the churches I've served to read the book of Acts. Because you and I are living out the post-Easter witness of Jesus and what he calls all of us who are baptized to be doing. Proclaiming the truth that he died, he rose again, and that he was bodily resurrected, and that he appeared and he showed himself in ways that remind us that God's love wins. Death will never have the final word. God bless you during this Easter season. Take care.